Today, we're talking with Ray Husband. Ray is the founder and CEO of Property Meld. Property Meld is a SaaS platform for property managers to manage maintenance. I've known Ray for most of his entrepreneurial journey and excited to share with you his experiences. So sit back and enjoy this episode. Well, welcome, Ray. It's awesome to have you on the podcast, man. Thanks for making the time. Thank you so much, Todd, uh, for having me. Super excited to, to be on today. Well, good. Well, good. Well, why don't we start at the beginning a little bit? Um, I think you come uh, to entrepreneurship through some different doors than maybe some. Um, and so maybe talk a little bit about your background from, you know, kind of what you did in college to ending up being the CEO of Property Mill. Yeah, I always uh, say that I took probably one of the most unconventional approaches, but then as you talk to other entrepreneurs, you realize um, nearly all of them came from an unconventional approach. So <clears throat> a little bit about my background. So I uh, originally went to school as a mining engineer and candidly, it was like, I kind of just chose that engineering uh, because I got picked to do it. There wasn't something originally super passionate. I ended up falling in love with it, but went to mining engineering. And then uh, <clears throat> I went out into the world of, uh, you know, being a professional uh, out in the industry. And it wasn't very long, probably a year before I wasn't even doing engineering. I was just doing team leadership stuff all the way up to moving around. And, and I was a plant manager of a, a cementitious uh, material facility in Baltimore. And uh, then I made the very next logical step, which is uh, decided to start a software company. So kind of no real clear path there. I don't know what I was drinking at the time, but yeah, that's right. But you know, one of the things I think it's interesting about your journey is it started with a, a human problem. It, it was a problem that you had. And so maybe pivot from um, you know, doing your job to, tr you know, transferring from job to job, and then some of the problems you had, you know, that really kind of led you to, to you know, property management. So I, th I think sometimes, uh, at least in the moment, you may not think that uh, something is quite as a, much of a gift as it, as it is. And so a lot of my early professional career was after the, um, the housing crash in 08, 09. So as you can imagine, I was in the construction materials, um, it wasn't a fun time to be in that business. They were printing money when I was in college. And then as soon as I got out, it was like, we got to figure out how to cut costs. And so I probably spent the last the, the six years uh, figuring out how to live without, figuring out how to get more resource out of the, the same uh, uh, thing, making sure quality, safety, you know, kind of limiting constraints. And so as I went through that, I, I ended up getting the opportunity to go jump from plant to plant. I was willing to move. I was willing to kind of do do some of that. And uh, <clears throat> the big thing that I was learning at that time, even though maybe I didn't notice it, that I think I'm thankful for later, is the fact that I learned how to like systematically solve problems that ended up reducing the cost ultimately to do that, right? And so then um, when it kind of came through and kind of the idea or genesis for <clears throat> Property Meld came through, uh, my co-founder, David Kingman, called me one day and he was telling about his very terrible uh, rental experience. He sat there and had a maintenance request happen or a few of them. And he tried calling the office and, you know, um, did all the stuff and it was terrible. And so I went and did some research. Essentially, I called property managers and I was like, it is terrible for the renter. I lived it. I moved around a lot. It's terrible for them. Is there also a business case? for these property management firms that they also hate it and it's super costly. And so I was able to kind of to, you know, use what was kind of the problem solving of what was considered a relatively negative time or some of the things that I got to learn during that to kind of map over and go, wow, uh, who our customers are today. The property managers don't like it. It's not efficient. It's not that. Residents don't like this. And so, yeah, it was born out of a human problem, but kind of uh, later identified it was the parallels between the two, my industry growing up and software that I kind of realized it was kind of training for me, even though not directly. Yeah. And what's cool with that story is it was kind of a personal problem that you experienced, both you and David experienced, and then you kind of started from there. And I think that a lot of good startups start with, I experienced this problem and I want to solve it and make it better. Uh, maybe pivoting a little bit, you mentioned David uh, Kingman. I mean, uh, you know, I think your 
story about having um, two co-founders is is good. I think there's a higher success rate with two co-founders and you have some different skill sets. Maybe talk a little bit about, um, you know, your relationship with David, how you guys met, and then like the different skill set you bring to the table. Yeah, so uh, I think if you ask him, and I think he's right, uh, we met in AP physics class in high school. Okay. Uh, we both had to stay after class and we were grouped up and uh, <clears throat> ended up realizing, you know, there's a lot of a lot of things we liked about each other. Um, and so anyways, we, we'd known each other a while, went to college even a little bit uh, together for a while. Um, and what we ended up kind of staying in touch, um, but we had a lot of trust and stuff, other things built up. And we always kind of like talked about this idea of starting a company both had the same passions and so on so when we did start a company one of the one of the greatest benefits and i'm not sure everybody gets the luxury of having this but we had an immense amount of trust built already um, which is super important um, but i think the second thing is we used to we've kind of tried to figure out and identify like what do we what do we each do like at first i used to be like i'm the gas pedal he's the brake pedal he really hated that because he didn't <clears throat> he's not the brake pedal. He just kind of keeps me in check. And so it was like, I'm the engine here. He's the steering wheel. Um, but as we've kind of evolved as leaders, we've just realized kind of the, di the dichotomy of our skill sets and our passions um, really complement each other. So, um, you know, I consider him an intellect. Um, he's really good about how do you make sure and kind of provide autonomy to teams and, and create some accountability where I've got probably a little bit more gifts in the human psychology elements and the customer. And we end up kind of like bashing some of them together. Um, but it's, uh, I could not speak more highly of what having a great co-founder does, not just from, com compel uh, you know, kind of like skills, but just you know, there's really hard times in a startup and having somebody that you got some trust with and that will ride out with you is um, was and uh, is critical. So, yeah, and maybe I'll uh, put a, a stronger point on it. I think you bring. Um, you, I mean, today you're the CEO, and you basically um, are in charge of kind of the business side, and, and David's really in charge of the product and the technical side. Um, and so, I think broadly, you bring some very different skills that are pretty complementary together. Um, and like you said, you have some of that trust. You kind of work through a bunch of things. Um, and I think, you know, it really helps be a good team early on, right? I think you you probably played some product management type roles early on, trying to interview all these customers about what their problems were. David was building some of this. Um, and really, how did you get go from this concept of the problem to building a product to convincing somebody to actually buy and, and basically try it out? Like, where did the pain, who was your first customer? What was that experience of like, just really trying to convince them to take a flyer? Oh man. So first of all, so we had a business plan of how, how fast we were going to get product adoption and, and customers. <clears throat> and I laugh, I laugh at it today because we expected so much so quickly, but then we underestimated how much it would grow later. So it was kind of a funny thing, but I think like the first thing is like realizing how hard it is to get those first 10 customers and get like some semblance of an MVP out there that people yeah. will pay money for. And so the great dichotomy of kind of our you know relationship was really around this idea that he was building and I was trusting him to build it. And he was saying, you go sell it and give me feedback on what we need, right? So that was kind of the, the relationship that we had there. <clears throat> so, I mean, I tell people all the time, like whatever, however long you plan on it taking, it's gonna take longer. And that was my experience. You end up finding even something as simple as your pitch on how you position your software. Like, what do you even call it? What kind of software is it? How do you press like, it? You Always stumble things. upon, yeah, you make, you make calls and they're like, no, I already got that. You just that iterative process of like getting inching to that next gate or opportunity. So it's like, they'll take the call. Now they'll listen to the problems. Now I can show them the demo. Now they want them to buy. Each one of those is like a little miniature battlefield uh, of iterations. And sometimes that involve building product. Um, there's an obstacle we can't overcome. With some casualties along the way, I'm sure. <laughs> <clears throat> a lot of casualties, yeah, a lot exactly. of dead bodies, a lot yeah. of dead brain cells and yeah. Yeah. Well, good. I mean, you got through it. You got your first 10 and, and today you think about the scale and it's like, I don't know 
how you think about scale. I mean, it's like, you know, I, I probably met you, you know, seven years ago, somewhere in there, six, seven years ago. Um, and, you know, you were doing, I don't know, somewhere in the neighborhood, $150,000, $200,000 a year, a um, couple employees. And, you know, I think I think about where we were then versus where you are today. And like the amount of scale and the challenges uh, along those lines, I'm sure you would say, you know, there's there's themes to that. There's different challenges. How do you break that up? How do you how do you learn to scale going from let's say the first ten to the first hundred to the next thousand? So, uh, so when you kind of scaling and you were kind of mentioning a lot of dead bodies along the way, I think this is this is where you know I've got kind of a really painful upward trajectory sine curve kind of into this, right? Um, so I think the first thing. <clears throat> that I think was really uh, helpful for a mentor to uh, tell me. It was super early, but they said, your first 10 customers, you will basically kill yourself to get the first 10. But then once you get the first 10, you can get the next 100 easier than you got the first 10. Mm. And so I think finding whatever that product, the message, whatever, that's where you're, you're going to struggle a lot. But then you kind of get to that point where you're talking about scaling. All right, I've got a general assemblance of like, how do I do this? But then you've got to start answering some of the more important questions that like, I'm selling this by myself and with a process that I know how to do, how do I take and replicate myself or break my portions of jobs into people and go do it? Um, but I think that's like the first thing is like, how do you take what you've got and try to like build a machine that you can go and get some people to go do? And I think, that was one of the most difficult parts for me. And what I failed on a lot was to actually find ways to get that systematically done well. And do you, I mean, I think there's a couple of things embedded in that. One of them is, I would say there's a step between, and this maybe goes to your first 10, but it's like, you keep iterating a message. And at some point in time, the marketing, the positioning, the pricing, the discussions, you start to see the patterns, right? Like you're like, okay, 80% of the time, this is kind of the same thing. And then, then it's a difference. What I think you're saying is there's a huge difference between you interpreting that environment where you think that's repeatable <laughs> versus bringing somebody on that didn't have all this experience that you just did to get there. And so there's a delta on like, okay, I'm seeing it as 80% the same thing and I can iterate from there. But it's a super different thing to like bring somebody in cold that maybe doesn't know the industry, hasn't been on the same journey to basically replicate that. And that means assets, tools, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, and my my first two sales people, I, I ended up trying to do remote, not having them sit right next to me and try to like learn everything. Um, those first two people didn't make it, not because they weren't capable, I don't think, but I think there's probably an over over uh, kind of emphasis on how simplest simplistic the process is, but your job is to find a way to get it out of your brain, and I think. Like you're right, there's step one, get the message that works. What gets past the to the to the no to looking and saying yes, and then going, all right, like what did you do there? And how can you give everything that you've learned to other people to go and do that same thing? So just as a context, um, so we've got today, I think 30 people in our sales department or in our revenue generation, <clears throat> but I will tell you getting the first successful salesperson to be selling on their own was like probably one of the most challenging things uh, to actually make happen. Do you think your engineering background really helped you in that? I mean, it's almost like process <clears throat> engineering, right? I mean, it's like it's steps, it's boxes, it's gates. And I think as an engineer, you already think that way. And so you're applying it to a system. And I think that type of methodology or thought process probably deconstructs this into something that's a tangible block that you could kind of continue to iterate with metrics. You know, I, I do think it's helped as I've scaled. I think, I think part of the initial, um, and, and I couldn't like going back, I don't think I was probably smart enough to pick apart what I was doing well and like what was happening there. Yeah. I just happened to have like a input output that was getting past the gatekeeper. And I didn't know why it was happening. I think initially it was like, how do you copy paste my pitch? Like mm -hmm. it was, it was that and, and copy and paste the objections you're going to hear with like the rebuttals, right? Like, how do you come back? And so I think that's what it was very much initially is getting people to go through the same, be exactly like I'm doing and then just replicate. Now, as you scale, you're talking about 
you can't carbon copy. I'm not doing as much sales anymore. You can't carbon copy me and the market might have changed and everything else. I think there was a point there probably around, you know, maybe one of six, five to six salespeople that I really started having hiccups around. I couldn't get everyone to run that playbook somehow. And it just was creating vast efficiencies. And so I think that's where kind of that engineering mindset and going, how do I break this down into pieces? What are you trying to accomplish each section? Uh, I think that's where it really took off. Um, so it was probably early, pretty early stage, but. Okay. I mean, that makes sense. So you've talked a little bit about hiring and stuff and and talking about it, you know, like at some point in time, you start to have enough success where it's not just you and David and one other person, you're starting to add some folks and that's positive. And, um, you know, it just seems like the amount of work multiplies, you get to bring people on, but like critical hires at the beginning, like talk to me about like, are you hiring generalists? Are you hiring specifics? You know, does that change as you scale? Uh, how good are you at the process of hiring? Have you gotten better over time? Like, I, I think there's a whole bunch of stuff here that like hiring good people at the right time makes a huge difference. If you screw it up, it makes it so much harder. I, I had no clue, uh, Todd. Like, I think, you know, early on, and you're a broke company. Like, I was a broke company. And so it was like, you're sitting there trying to convince somebody who's a professional to say, I need you to quit everything you're doing. I need you to give up your comfy lifestyle. I need you to sit there and come in and maybe work for what is less and what was less than market value and take a bet and with a company that may not be around in three months, right? Um, and so I think like then it was thinking through and I was really trying to target and sell what we were trying to do. And that was huge because it's really hard to get people in the door, right? Um, especially competent people who are willing to kind of take a gamble with you. And so I think at first it was almost seemingly sales in just like, please come and try, right? You have to be somebody that I think can do it, but like, just come on and bet on this, right? And I think uh, that that worked uh, well, but it didn't because you'd end up being opportunistic about who's willing to, as opposed to who's the right person. And so if you kind of take that further, then you start to realize and kind of pick up patterns of who's making it in the company and who's not. What are sort of the common themes that they have? What are some of the core values, uh, sort of ways that they operate that start to become like you're getting an idea and now it's become what I'd say is a lot more uh, thoughtful and thankfully so, because um, like I said, if it was uh, a lot of lot of dead bodies while I was trying to uh, <laughs> trying to learn that skill. I guess uh, one of the pieces that you talked about is I think like um, communication in startups and as founders, like that's got to be a given, right? If you can't get you know early people excited about your vision about what you're doing, regardless of their domain expertise. Um, I think that's a, a non-starter. And so, and I think, you know, whether you call it sales or whether you call it motivation, whether you call it having a vision, um, I think that's a critical skill. And I think as you think about where you started and versus the, maybe the toolbox of communication has gotten better and broader where you kind of know audiences and kind of what they need. There's a different message internally to your folks than there is externally to people, to prospects versus investors. Um, talk to me a little bit about like just your communication style, because I think you're gifted in this area. You use it. Um, and I think it's a key element to the success you've had, but I think you've had to develop it over time. Yeah. And I'll actually give huge credit to this, to, to mentorship. I think uh, wildfire has been really helpful at this and, and it allows me to kind of like had some tooling. I do have a kind of an engineering brain and I do enjoy talking to people. I enjoy that experience. And so I think like my whole elements is going like, really getting crisp on what are some of the goals you're trying to accomplish. I think a lot of the times when you're good at selling something or whatever, you're shooting from the hip and you're like, I'm just going to have an answer for everything and just really think on my heels. But I think as you're trying to get more crisp about a message landing, whether that be to a prospective employee, a big customer, or maybe some investors is like really taking time to think through the goal and then thinking about these mental gates you're trying to get through. And again, I think these are some great toolbox items picked up from mentorship um, in there, but the ability to set a goal and then think through some gates you're building, and then you can map it back to who do you who are you talking to? 
Are you talking to an investor who's trying to make a great return? Are you talking to an employee that's, you know, really uh, fed up with their job or or wants a different career or wants a different path? Is it that prospect that's terrified of making a change? And so the ability to really get that process down allows you to plan <clears throat> and really get that message driven home. And I think that's a that's a huge part where I think um, mentorship candidly has really helped me kind of un unlock uh, that. So maybe to kind of summarize that, I mean, it's it's more deliberate is basically, I think what you're saying, it's it's audience dependent, it's message dependent, um, it's trying to solve a problem and you realizing that you have a communication and a tool and a message to carry to get you through to, you know, move something forward. Yeah, and, yeah. and you think about what serious things in life do you just wing? Yeah. You know, um, and and I think once you realize how important communication is and, you know, what you're trying to do, the aspect of actually planning it is uh, uh, becomes very obvious, although it doesn't seem so at first. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, you just recently hired uh, an executive, you know, in engineering. And one of the comments that he made, I think, to you was something the, about the effect of um, you measure a lot of things. And so I do think this is a cultural trait for you. Um, and I, again, I'd be curious if you think this is more engineering and kind of what you ended up doing post-graduation that drove you, um, but you're pretty metrics driven from a corporation. And so how, how do you think about this early on? When do you start to introduce these metrics? How many is too many? Um, you know, I think a lot of people would say, I'll measure everything. And it's like, well, no, you can't do that. You got to find a balance based on where you are from a scale perspective. Um, and I think a lot of this, at least, I think you would subscribe to kind of the Peter Drucker, you know, mentality of you, you can't improve what you can't measure. Um, and so maybe talk a little bit about that, because I think it's been a key success to kind of the way you've looked at how do you continue to grow and scale? So su super good observation. I, I think, you know, even though I am an engineer, like picking what to measure is like really hard and I think requires, uh, a, you know, at least for me, a lot of bumping aheads to figure out what's important and, and what actually do you need to move. You know, I think as you're first starting, you're just trying to get product market fit. And so trying to be like over analytical is problematic. You just need to be qualitative, which means you just need to understand what the customer or the prospect saying and figure out and interpret what that means and go fix product, right? Um, early on, it wasn't how many calls am I making? <clears throat> uh, how many surveys did people fill out or anything like that? It was very, very qualitative. But I think as you start to go a little bit uh, broader and you're trying to define success of like roles. Somebody's supposed to do something. I hired a salesperson. I hired a developer. I hired somebody to help implement. <clears throat> That's when you really need to start thinking about what does success look like in that role? And oftentimes everyone will have their own version of what that means. I worked hard. No, you didn't work hard. Who's going who's gonna to determine whether that's true or not? And so the faster you can get at least to known elements of measurables um, that are important, especially as you scale, the faster you can have great conversations uh, with employees, team members, the faster you can give them a North Star of what excellence looks like, it allows it to be um, very clear about what everyone's job to be done is. And so even though I am an engineer, I would say the vast majority of people at Property Meld are not, yeah. but they love a scoreboard. Everybody wants to know if I'm doing good or am I not doing good. And by creating measurables, it allows to remove the ambiguity of what success looks like. I, maybe a different way to think about it, too, is I think it's taking out the the. Um, the infer like it's not about activity and what you're doing and working, it's about output, right? And so I think like these measures, and I think you've had people that have worked hard, but didn't get the output that they were looking for for the role. And it wasn't like they're bad employees, it could be not trained properly, not focused on the right stuff. Um, but I think, you know, mm -hmm. I think it's a pivot for your for all startups on saying, I'm really measuring the outcome, not the activity. Yeah, and I would say, you know, just just in general, like it's taken us a bit to get super tight on measurables. Like early on, like I think you should rely on your gut. You ended up getting your kind of idea there, but it's tr eventually translating the gut to allow you to like give other people direction on. You may not have the same gut as me, 
but here's a number that should look like this, right? Um, but I'll, I'll say like everybody cares about output. Like if you're a salesperson, how much did I close? Now, I think you start to get to where like, what are the numbers that matter most that says, am I doing a good job or not? And then I think as you get more mature, you can start figuring out what, what activities and behaviors influence that outcome. Mm -hmm. Like I don't make enough calls. There's no way you're going to get enough sales. Like calls does not equal sales, but not enough calls. You know, you, there's no chance of getting sales. And so I think as you mature, you start going from like those numbers that matter the most to giving direction to people to say, if I do these things, then chances are I will have a really good outcome. So I think there's kind of an evolution. You go from gut feel to like super critical numbers to how do you actually start figuring out what behaviors lead to those numbers. Um, and I think that's kind of the maturation of measurement. Yeah, that's good. It's a it's a good and nuance uh, to it. So I appreciate that. Um, we've mentioned culture a couple times in this conversation, um, and I think this all kind of comes back to a lot of this, which is what you're trying to build. You know, culture means different things to different people. Um, you, I think, as founders, you kind of define it yourselves by your activities, behaviors, and what you kind of you know what you value. Um, it's one thing when it's a small team. It's another thing when you got 50, 60 people. And so how do you, how would you describe kind of the meld culture? How would you think, like, what is that, you know, like, what did you and David really care about that you think you could translate to? And then as you think about hiring and scaling, how do you preserve and reinforce good behavior and basically tamp down and basically tell people, you know, maybe this isn't the right thing, especially when you have a wide range of ages, right? You have people that are super young professionally to, you know, more experienced people that have had experiences elsewhere. Yeah, I so I'll just kind of start out by just saying in general, I drastically underappreciated the concept of culture and core values. You know, I think, and that's maybe part of the engineer. I just assumed everybody, you do your thing. And if everybody does their thing, the machine works. And then when the machine works, you build a business and create great whatever. Um, but I, I learned uh, over the years that that really doesn't work. And the culture and the core values are almost kind of like the self-regulating mechanism that if everybody kind of operates in a similar way, it's almost like a self-policing. And so if you were to think like about a football team, <clears throat> for example, you've got a culture of winning or you've got a culture of working hard, like you got to watch some of those football players when, you know, maybe somebody is not doing or they're not working out or they're not doing whatever. The other fellow football players will sit there and go, hey, I don't want to lose because you're freaking dinking off. Like that's the self-regulating kind of idea of a culture. And so um, I think as we've matured as a company, you know, it was really and it really was an evolution kind of kind of started as let's work hard. Let's just figure it out. Let's break stuff. Let's just get customers. Let's do whatever we can. And then it was let's scale. Failure is OK. We got to experiment. It's OK to learn. And then we evolved into, <clears throat> hey, we actually have to hit numbers. That's how we stay alive. That's how everybody does. You can fail, but it needs to be very short lived. And uh, you've got to do that. And so I think we've kind of and I don't know if it will continue to evolve, but I think we've kind of ended up the point that you're allowed to miss and allowed to learn. I think that's an expectation. Um, but I think the important thing is, is what are you going to do to compress that time to as low as humanly possible? And <clears throat> that needs to be aggressive. So sitting there saying, I'll figure it out, you know, next month, next year um, is unacceptable when you're trying to scale very quickly. You have to fix problems very fast. And so I think that's kind of the culture that, um, that we've really brought in um, to property meld. What do you think it is specifically though when you're like hiring for somebody new like so you bring in somebody new and you're in the interview process do you ask them cultural alignment questions to get make sure they're a good fit or do you basically look for domain expertise and then we'll put you in the situation and and you basically will be self-corrected or you'll get bounced so so there was a great uh person that started a business and i was uh talking to him about something and he's in South Dakota and he's like, have you ever been at work and you've walked, you watched somebody do something and there wasn't anything technically wrong with it, but it just pissed you off. He's like, that is a core value. 
Um, so if you were to say, for example, it's five o'clock and you're still working and there's a customer with a catastrophic incident and somebody says, hey, listen, my time's up. I got to go. And you're like, technically, yeah, that's what we've asked you to work is this time. But they walk out on the customer and you are irate and like you're learning what your core values are. And so <clears throat> so when you kind of start to identify those and really give an idea of like when we operate a certain way or what our core values are, then, yeah, you have to hire for them or else you're going to have oil and water in your organization, just people getting angry because we're not all operating the same way. And so I think we kind of had to learn and articulate what those core values are. What does it mean? And I think at that point, that's where you're actually able to start hiring. So for me, I don't, I probably don't ask uh, core value questions. Um, I know what core values are, and I, I try to ask questions ultimately that give me indications of what do they do in their regular life that indicate their core values. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, it's really easy. So one of ours is humility. And sorry to be long-winded on this answer. <clears throat> one of ours is humility, which means you've got a white belt mentality. So if I was to sit there and say, are you humble? Of course, everybody's going to say yes. I'm, I'm the humblest of the humble. And um, But if you were to sit there in a meeting and, and find something that say, like they're talking about a past employer or past whatever, and be like, um, what, is there a chance that they're right? Like they're right about this particular thing and you were wrong. You get to watch real quick if somebody's willing to consider the reality that maybe they're not right. Or they get to see their physical reactions of like, there's no way I'm wrong. And there's different ways you can do that, but it's creating parallels. But long story short, validating some of those things is super important uh, before you put them on your team. Yeah. Yeah. Because a, a bad hire is expensive. There's no question about Oof. it in any level. Oof. So Yeah. Um, you know, I think there's a misconception maybe a little bit about entrepreneurs as doing it, just slogging it out and building something alone. Um, I think the ones that are successful, I mean, it takes, you know, mentors and people around them in a network to really get it done. Um, I think in a lot of cases, most of us as entrepreneurs haven't seen all these patterns. We haven't seen, we haven't done go to market. We haven't scaled companies before. Some of us have. But I think like it takes uh, other people's perspectives. And so maybe talk to me a little bit about your role of how mentors have helped you kind of shape, challenged you, uh, maybe give you some ideas of patterns that have worked elsewhere that you're applying to your business. Um, I, I think sometimes this is a lot of mentors. I think if you do it well, you try to sink, you know, behind the founders. And so I think sometimes um, it's not always seen, but I think it's a critical element to a lot of times the success of an organization. Oh, I thousand percent agree. I'm I'm incredibly uh, thankful that I was able to get the founders that I was able to get. And I, I give um, so much of the credit to Wildfire and what you guys all did um, to kind of help shortcut. And I think the I think the big thing is if you think about a business, it's going to take you longer than you think. It's going to take more resources than you think. It's going to take more grit than you think. And so there's like a saying that every entrepreneur is like a foot from gold, which means most people quit right before the end. And so if you think about you've only got so many miles in the gas tank, that's what you've got when you start. If you think about that element and going, I'm going to drive to this destination, but you don't have a map, you don't have a framework, you don't have Google Maps telling you anything, you could run out of gas before you get up to the destination. And so I think what mentors and kind of encircling yourself with really intelligent thought experts is like they most likely have screwed up before. They've learned some very powerful lessons and they're able to sit there and be in the passenger seat and be like, hey, I know it's going to look like that going straight is the right thing, but that's actually going to take you off to Timbuktu and you're going to lose X amount of miles. Mentorship, I look at as almost kind of shortening the road to getting to that destination. And that is really, really critical when your resources are limited to having some success, whether it be your own personal uh, mental survival, your grit, uh, cash, time. Uh, mentors really help shortcut some of those processes. And that can be the difference between legitimately having a business that makes it and doesn't. That's good. Do you think that's changing or has changed from like when you think about, you know, mentors that helped you at three employees versus, you know, people in the middle? I, I just I think 
I, I think about this as the same as kind of good boards, right? They they probably should have some variation because the types of problems that you're trying to say that you're trying to tackle need to change. And if that uh, mentor is really in their sweet spot in one area, maybe it doesn't scale to what you're doing. So I don't know what your experience is there. If if the people that you kind of relied on early are the same that you're doing today, or if that's changed over time. So I, I think the important thing is, so if I was to take a snapshot of myself six years ago, I'd like, I don't even want to look at myself six years ago because <laughs> kind of boisterous, annoying, and it's like good, uh, beyond uh, optimistic, probably too much so. Um, but I think the element is like, everyone's at a certain place. And whether you're looking at an employee, you're looking at yourself, like you're at a certain place and you need to develop in some certain things next, right? Um, if you're a CEO and you're sitting there going, I want to have a big company and you're, you're saying, okay, I'm just going to think big strategy and like go do all this stuff that none of that matters. If you can't get distribution, yeah. like you have to go get sales. And so that might be the first thing you have to learn. So I think the big thing is making sure that you have mentors that complement the problem sets and are able to assist in the problem sets that you're currently dealing with. And I think even more importantly, I think this is something that wildfire has done really well is like looking at what problems are coming ahead. Mentors should know the next thing that's coming ahead and being like, I'm going to start working on you with this because that way, again, like the road shortening, you can already start being on that direction. And so uh, I absolutely think you match the mentors. And if you're fortunate enough to get a mentor that can keep scaling with you, I think that's best, but you might end up much like boards or whatever, being kind of changing the pieces around as you go based on what you need and who's going to challenge you and, and look ahead for you. Yeah, I think it's good, Ray. And I think that's a critical component where sometimes I think people uh, underestimate the role that that can have in helping them. Um, and like you said, it's just, you know, can I help you read the map a little bit better? Can I understand what mistakes I've made so that you don't make those? You're going to make other ones, but that's going to happen. Mm. Um, you know, maybe uh, the next one is uh, talking a little bit about you have traveled around and lived in a bunch of different locations in the United States. Um, you grew up in Wyoming, and then you chose to come back to Rapid City to build a business. And so I don't think that's uh, where most people think about <clears throat> building a startup. Um, and so I'm curious about um, why. And, and you know, and I think you had that in your mind pretty early on about like you wanted to get back to this region and then build something enduring in this location. Yeah, so super great question. So just a little run up for anybody listening, just to kind of get an idea where. Um, so I grew up in Wyoming, went to school at the School of Mines here in Rapid. Um, always loved it, just as a young person, loved kind of the outdoor activities, the freedom, the, um, you know, to be able to be at a lake in 25 minutes or be downtown and eat, right? Um, so I always loved that. But after that, I was in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I did a small stint in California. I was in the Chicago area for a little bit. Then I went to Baltimore. And so, you know, I think I, uh, as I used to joke, I kind of dated the country a little bit. So I got to understand what I like, what I didn't like. And there was always something sitting there going, that's actually a really cool place. There's a lot of incredibly intelligent people that uh, work insanely hard that I want to live there. And two, you know, how can I capture some of that brain power? And so that was one of the reasons, uh, you know, kind of to initially moving back. Um, and so I think that that but then it's like, you know, what are the different things that uh, that ultimately this area kind of allows. And so I've got a mentor, super, super high up executive at a big name company that, you know, was talking about the superpower of communities like this for startups and technology companies. He's like, you know, uh, I was in, I forget what town it was. It was some small town in Vermont, um, startup. I think they became a billion dollar company. And he's like, there's something fantastic is when you put something here and put something special here and you have all these people that are truly capable of it, that they want and gravitate. You're not nearly as competing as you would in, in Silicon Valley and some of these things. And so you can almost create something of a superpower by being in a community like this that's got a ton of mentorships that are looking for things. You've got the community resources that probably you don't have at other things. And on top of that, you have people that want to be what at, at your place doing what you're doing. And so between all of that, I think um, not learning that until later, I've realized it's a bit of a superpower um, of people who want 
some of this experience and they're willing to jump in and roll up sleeves uh, unlike a lot of other places um, that that I've been I'm not not saying people in all those towns don't work that's not my intent <laughs> no but I think it's different you know it's like I did my startups in the 90s um, and then I think about like the, you know, kind of uh, business culture, startup culture that we had in Rapid City when you started. And then you think about where it is today. You think about like building a pipeline to the school of mine so you can get better engineers. You think about the advent of Elevate, our economic development organization and kind of what it's doing. Um, you think about, you know, some of the business friendly tax situations that we have in the state. I mean, there is not only the quality of life here, but there's a bunch of aspects that I think lead to what you're talking about, which is like saying there's a lot of opportunity here um, if somebody wants to invest and has a great idea that can execute and build into a sustainable business. Yeah. And, and I would say, even though I'm in rapid, Todd, and certainly we've been imported talent for sure. Um, I think one of the very special things, at least in the segment that we're playing, just from the talent front, um, I put our team up nationally against a lot of software companies. Yeah. Um, and I and I and I say that earnestly, um, you know, it's just kind of the grit, the passion, the hard work, how fast they want to learn and just recognizing the opportunity. So that's one. And you're right. The business, uh, this communities want you to win. This community wants you to win. And there's a ton of advantages of that. You go to a lot of other places where you're kind of like small fish in a giant pond. Nobody cares about you. Yeah. Um, when you're a startup in a community that's really trying to push technology and software and entrepreneurship, it makes life so much easier. And you just have a ton of additional resources that I would not have access to had I jumped to one of the hubs. Yeah, that's good. All right. Two more questions for you. Um, one that's probably a little cringeworthy for you. If you had to go back and tell your, uh, yourself before or your first year that you were starting six, seven years ago, uh, what would you tell yourself? What have you learned today that you'd love to like basically go back to that individual and tell? Because I think a lot of people that listen to the podcast are basically in the early journeys of that. And so what kind of words of wisdom would you tell your, yourself seven, eight years ago? Uh, you know, I would have told myself, I don't know if I would have listened, um, <laughs> That's a different thing. Yeah, yeah, let's let's go and just tell myself, assuming I'd listen. Um, I think one of the big things is when I started as an entrepreneur, you know, in corporate, I was told that I was very, you know, this is my own narrative of myself. I don't know if this would actually be said, but I was like, you're a high performer. You get to go do cool things. You're really young doing the job you are. You're special. And I think I took a bit of that ego to start up. And I think it cost me a lot of speed of learning. learning. And so I think if I was to go and talk to myself is like, you're gonna get kicked in your teeth a lot harder than you think. Take the help of the mentors and know that your ability to recognize those challenges in yourself and be able to iterate them will probably be one of the differentiating factors of your success. Mm -hmm. And so I think, being coachable, whatever I had to tell myself to be coachable, um, that's probably what I would have tried to go back. Um, I got, I had to get hit with a baseball bat a couple of times for me to finally get the lesson, but I, I could have saved some time. Yeah. I appreciate the, <laughs> the, uh, honesty in that one. I, I think, you know, I think it's good. I mean, I think we all have to be honest with ourselves and, and there's always things that we could do better. And so, um, I think, um, I think that's good. I, I think it's a really good message for other people that are starting on that journey. I really do. Uh, and it's hard, right? Because I think as an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. you've heard no so many times already and you're like, no, I can go figure it out. And so it's finding that balance of like, I'm going to go get this done, but I've got to listen to other people to like make it better. But like, what do I listen to and what I don't? It's, it's a super tough yeah. skill. I, I would say be verbose and just know that nobody's going to listen to you until you figure out the message. Like you have to be yeah find a way to be whatever you think is right. Like you're going to push way harder and you can't listen. But when, when it's coming to your own skill set and your ability, not what you're trying to do, your own skill set and ability, I think that's where, but you're, you're right. I should hopefully didn't talk past Ray into being like, Hey, you need to listen to those customers that said, or prospects that said, you know, this is, there's no need for this. Ah, right. Dang it. Maybe I should listen to them. No, that's the ones you don't listen <laughs> that's to. That's what I do. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Well, good. Well, hey, the last one I always close uh, each podcast with, 
um, is a little kind of slice of humanity. I think it's like, it's what's the kindest thing anybody's ever done for you. And so I don't know if you got a chance to kind of think about that and, and come up with a story, but I, I think it's always a great way to close these out. Um, the kindest thing, thing, <clears throat> Todd. So, um, you know, I would probably say in general, and I'm going to overlap it because I can, I can name multiple examples of this kindest thing. People gave me time when I had nothing to give them back anything. And so I've talked to business leaders. I remember when I was first starting Property Mel, I was in Baltimore at the time and I had a CEO and I'm giving an example of this, but I had a CEO that took four hours of his day of a 200 person company to tour me around his office. And it just, because I was an entrepreneur and he wanted to help and he would hop on calls, super busy. I've had people like yourself jump in. I've got nothing to do. I, whatever, it's a pass forward. Let's map through some problems. I'm expecting nothing in return. And so I think there's multiple of those examples where I had nothing to give anybody and they still chose to give me time, expertise. And uh, it's a, when you realize the gift that it was, um, and, and especially when you really realize how much time they had, um, it's, it's incredibly uh, special to me. And I guess, um, so I appreciate you saying that. And I think it's true. I think what you're already starting to pivot though is um, doing the same thing, right? You're, you, you've you recognized that in your own life. And I think you're finding <clears throat> opportunities to give back. I mean, we talked about a school of minds opportunity just you know today. Um, and so I do think it's important that we continue to do that. And we're lifting up the next you know group of people that are coming through because yeah. that's the only way this is gonna work. Um, and I yeah. think that is kind of part of our uh, our bond as, as, as people, as entrepreneurs is to continue to keep moving it forward. <laughs> Maybe they felt bad for me. Who knows? <laughs> no, I think it's all good. They see potential yeah. as what you hope, right? Yeah. You see, you know, and so, well, Ray, I think it's good. There's a ton of nuggets in here. I think that you have gone, uh, I mean, your story is awesome. I mean, I think just the the journey you've been on, um, you know, and I think, you know, who knows what inning we're in. I think you've got a lot of opportunity and growth in the company. Um, there's going to be more challenges, um, but you, the foundation and the journey that you've gone to get here is impressive. Um, and it's been fun to be part of it. Um, and I really appreciate you taking the time to share some of your wisdom with us. Hey, thanks, Todd. Appreciate it. Appreciate Wildfire Labs. Okay. Thanks again. All right. Thank you.